Welcome to my Body Language Seminar. I have been studying body language for several years and I have a few publications on the topic. I became interested in body language after attending faculty meetings where I recognized what I thought were unusual power dynamics. I have certifications for courses offered by Joe Navarro, retired FBI profiler, Paul Ekman, the microexpressions expert, and Greg Hartley and Scott Rouse from the Body Language Panel, as well as three situational awareness credentials, with the last one, Master Practitioner, awarded to fewer than 10 people in the world. That blending of situational awareness and nonverbal body language is unique and something new I bring to the work. Additionally, I am on an NSF grant as a consulting, looking at deception and in interviews. What I'm going to share with you today is a one hour version of a six hour course I developed on nonverbal body language. Let's get started. Introduction. Nonverbal communication is a process of sending and receiving messages without using words. It can be through body language, facial expressions, gestures, eye contact, and even the use of space. Nonverbal communication is a powerful tool for conveying information and emotions. Nonverbal communication is more revealing than words. For example, if someone tells you they are happy, but their body language demonstrates discomfort and their eyes are darting around, they're likely feeling nervous or uncomfortable around you. By being aware of nonverbal cues, you can adjust your own communication style to be more persuasive. Nonverbal communication can also help you to de-escalate conflict. If you see somebody's body language becoming aggressive, you may want to take a step back and give them some space. The meaning of nonverbal cues can vary from culture to culture. For example, making eye contact is seen as a sign of respect for some and aggression for others. The distance between two can also vary. In this image, we see Jerry and Paul in conversation. They are making eye contact and have a relaxed stance with feet pointing towards each other. The amount of personal space between them is typical for the US. Cultural factors can affect nonverbal communication. An example of this is touch, which is a common way to show affection in the US while in other countries, it could be deemed inappropriate. The meaning of facial expressions, like a smile, can vary depending on culture. The thumbs up gesture is a great example of culture diversity. In the US, it can mean confirmation or I'm okay. In Japan, it can indicate a secret love in Ukraine, a thumbs up means they are wishing you good luck. In some religions, it is considered disrespectful to make eye contact with those of higher status. Age plays a role too. Younger people are more likely to use gestures and touch, while older people tend to be more reserved. People with disabilities, like the hearing impaired young lady in the video, may use their own kind of nonverbal language. Personalities can also affect nonverbals. We can see here that some people are more expressive than others. Hot headed is a common phrase for what we just saw. We did not need to hear this conversation to know it did not end well. Emotions affect our nonverbals. When people are feeling happy, they will smile and make eye contact. When they're feeling sad, they do the opposite. Our health status can also change our nonverbal communication. 
when people are tired or sick, they have less energy to put up the barriers to show others a version of themselves they most likely prefer. Now that you know the what nonverbals are and the why we study them, let's move on to the how. Starting with a baseline, what happens before the communications start? Before a person is questioned, the interviewer will start a casual conversation about the weather or other topics that will put the interviewee at ease and then watch their body language. During a polygraph, they will also tell the interviewee the questions in advance so there is no doubt what they are asking. One example would be to ask, do you use drugs? The interviewee would have a chance to ask if this includes over-the-counter medication. If you talk to any body language expert, they will tell you the first step is to establish a baseline, the person's behavior when natural. What I bring to this work is the importance of first considering situational awareness. Situational awareness is the ability to be aware of your surroundings and to understand the potential risk and opportunities in a given situation. What I suggest is that once situational awareness has been established, then we worry about the baseline of the individual because the baseline will be affected by the environment in ways that could affect the response. In situational awareness, you observe, orient, decide, then act. When it relates to establishing a baseline, you observe, orient, and then you bring the individual into the equation. We respond differently depending on our environment, our comfort changes, Personal space needs differ. When we are surrounded by people that we know, we are more relaxed, more confident. If we are cold, we will draw ourselves in, we'll change our posture and appear more guilty when it could just be the air conditioner in the room. To ensure the responses interviewers get are directly related to the questions they ask, they could turn down the AC or offer a warm beverage. People are typically on their best behavior in a formal setting. They will hide their emotions, their true feelings. In some situations, you can also get the herd effect. Herd behavior is a behavior of individuals in a group acting collectively. Around our friends, we feel empowered. Culture and abilities contribute to the baseline. Taskin is from Bangladesh. In this video, he demonstrates how a head movement meant to show attentiveness can be misinterpreted to mean no. The last example is related to social diversity. Individuals with a higher social status expect more personal space. I focus this module on understanding how environment can affect our nonverbal communication. And by recognizing this, we can better interpret the nonverbal body language. Now let's find out why our body language is not always something we can control. The limbic system. Our limbic brain communicates through our bodies the true sentiments that we feel. Sensory input such as sights, sounds, and smells are visualized through our behavior and emotions. This happens with the help of our limbic system. The five main areas of the brain that make up the limbic system include the cingulate gyrus, thalamus, hypothalamus, amygdala, and the hippocampus. Each have their own function.
The cingulate gyrus regulates pain and emotion. The thalamus receives sensory and motor skill signals. The hypothalamus is responsible for our freeze, flight, fright response. The amygdala is our emotion center and the hippocampus is responsible for our memory. The freeze, fight, or flight response is a physiological reaction that occurs in response to a perceived threat. The body releases hormones such as adrenaline that prepares our body to freeze, fight, or flee the threat. The hormones cause a number of changes in the body, including the changes in nonverbal body language listed in this fact sheet. The nonverbal body language cues are all signs that the body is preparing for either fight or flight. The increased heart rate and breathing help to deliver more oxygen to the muscles, which is necessary for either fighting or fleeing. The dilated pupils allow more light into the eyes, which is important for seeing the threat more clearly. The sweating helps to cool the body, which can become overheated dur during the fight or flight response. The tightening of the muscles prepare the body to either fight or flee. And changes in facial expressions and posture can also signal to others that this person is feeling threatened. It is important to note that not everyone will exhibit all of these nonverbal body language cues when they are experiencing the fight or flight response. When we hear a loud noise or feel threatened, we often freeze. This helps us not move so we can assess the world around us. Predators chase movement, so by freezing, we are playing dead, which can save lives. This worked for students at Columbine and Virginia Tech. Many freeze when in trouble and hold their breath or fix their feet in a position of security, interlocked behind chair legs. For survival, it is better to distance ourselves, lean away, or move back from the threat. Fight is the last response for defense and can be physical or with words. Shoplifters try to hide and that what, that's what makes them stand out. They will also turtle, which is raising their shoulders and lowering their head. We will also subconsciously turn our head away from bad food, bad smell, or bad people. This module covered the limbic system and how many of our nonverbal actions happen without thought or control. And this is why when there is conflict between what we see and hear, we should always believe the limbic system induced nonverbals. When we are uncomfortable, we pacify ourselves with nonverbal body language. This is especially true when we are uncomfortable in conversation because we're not being completely honest. Let's start with an example using a decision tree I developed for interrogations and interviews. Remember to look for clusters. This will strengthen your reading. The scenario is, I have John in my office. I note the weather is cold and he has never been in my office. Additionally, I'm a person of authority. When he sits, I see he has good posture and makes eye contact. This changes when I start to ask him about the cheating. He starts to look anxious, he averts his eyes and leans back in the chair. All signs of discomfort. To comfort himself, he starts leg cleansing and rubbing his neck and face. What is the likelihood that John is lying? Let's look at the decision tree. Subject is John Doe, question four, cheating. Situational awareness, it's cold outside, unfamiliar office, formal setting, person of authority. Baseline, good posture, eye contact. Discomfort, anxious, eyes averted, distancing. 
pacifiers. We see leg cleansing. He's rubbing his face and neck. Likely truthful or deception. What do you think? Pacifiers, also known as adapters, are self-soothing gestures people use to comfort themselves or to cope with stress. These actions may be repetitive and happen in clusters, and they're a way of managing anxiety or other negative emotions. But remember to pay attention to the context. In this video, we see Chris waiting to talk to the boss. She is looking nervous. When watching this video, you should recognize several nonverbal behaviors Chris is doing to pacify herself as a reaction to the discomfort she is feeling. Just a heads up, Ms. Rapp, like many of my volunteer actors, are demonstrating for this video and not actually feeling the emotions they are showing. In this video, Taskin is demonstrating leg cleansing. His hands are palms down on his sides and he slides them towards a knee. He may do it once or several times. This can be due to sweaty palms, sweating because he is nervous or uncomfortable. People have their personal favorites, like stroking their face. or adjusting their tie, or brushing the front of their shirt. Yawning excessively is another pacifier. We rub or massage our neck, sides of neck, under the chin, or above the Adam's apple to reduce blood pressure, lower heart rate, and to calm the individual. Mirroring is when we mimic the other's behavior, mannerisms, and movements, usually subconsciously, so we can better fit in. At funerals, everyone acts sad and solemn, even if they are not. When your nonverbals do not sync with others, like the shoplifter in the previous slides, you will stand out. Non-mirroring behavior was noticed in later photos with John Hinckley Jr. when he attempted to kill President Reagan and Arthur Bremer when he tried to assassinate Governor Wallace. Watch the students mirror each other while in conversation. In this module, you learned how to spot pacifiers, the importance of clusters, and how to pull it all together. I use a student teacher example for the body language decision tree, but it could just as easily be any type of interaction. The end of the pacifier adapter section. The body breakdown. In the past module, we covered adapters, the way to handle discomfort, but not the nonverbals associated with discomfort. Most people know to look for them in the face, maybe the arms, but there are many other areas of the body that will tell us the truth. Let's start with the face. When do we expose our lower teeth? We do it when we're happy, when we're joyful, that we smile and expose our teeth. Surprise, amusement, flirting, 
When people are flirting, they expose their teeth in a way that is playful and inviting. This is to show interest in another person. Dominance, in some cases, exposing teeth can be a sign of dominance. This is a way of showing that this person is in control and that they are not to be challenged. Face blocking, covering the eyes with hands. This is a way to block out unwanted stimuli, such as bright light or disturbing images. However, it can also be used to conceal emotions such as sadness, fear, or anger. Squinting the eye is another way to block out unwanted stimuli. Looking away is a way to avoid eye contact, but it can be seen as a sign of disrespect or disinterest. Fidgeting with the eyes. This can include things like blinking rapidly, rolling the eyes, or darting the eyes around. It is important to note that not all eye blocking is a sign of deception or negative emotions. It can also be a sign of concentration, fatigue, or simply being lost in thought. If someone is feeling uncomfortable or pained, they may close their eyes to block out the negative stimuli. Disinterest, deception, and meditation are also examples of eye blocking. Some people close their eyes in a way to meditate or focus on their inner thoughts and feelings. This can be a sign of relaxation and inner peace. Confirmation nods is another way we communicate non-verbally to show agreement, confirmation, understanding, or interest. In this next video, we have Miss Lois demonstrating three popular non-verbals, eye blocking, compressed lips, and nose flares. Thank you, Miss Lois. Next, eyes. Arouse, surprise, or confronted, our eyes open wide and dilate. If we see something that is bad, the pupils will constrict. Here is a squint. Lower eyebrows, when seeing something negative, can indicate weakness or low confidence. However, when we see them together, lower eyebrows and squint equals aggressive. Arched eyebrows signify high confidence and positive feelings. Eyes down and to the left. When someone looks down and to the left, it is a sign that they are accessing their long-term memory or having an internal conversation. This is because the left hemisphere of the brain is responsible for processing language and long-term memories. And the eyes tend to move to the left when the left hemisphere is active. Eyes to the right is for creation. When someone does this, it's a sign they are creating something new or emotional. In some cases, people look down to the right when they are trying to deceive someone. Head shake. Disagreement, disbelief, uncertainty, lack of interest. When someone shakes their head from side to side, it's often a sign that they are disagree with what is being said. High blink rate, we have stress, deception, confusion, Preening, self-confidence. When people preen their face, it's a sign they are feeling confident and self-assured. 
And because people often preen them face when they're trying to make a good impression or when they're feeling good about themselves. It can also mean discomfort and boredom. The mouth. Fake smiles do not go up in the corners. A real smile involves two muscles, zygomaticus major, which stretches from the corner of the mouth to the cheekbone, and the orbicularis oculi, which surrounds the eye. They draw the corners of the mouth up and crinkle the outer edges of the eyes, causing crow's feet. A fake smile includes the lip corners stretching sideways through the use of a muscle called the risorius, and when used bilaterally, it pulls the corners of the mouth sideways but cannot lift it upward like a real smile. For some people, their turned down corners of the mouth is actually normal. <laughs> the lips can express several nonverbal emotions, as does the tongue. Here we have Dr. Alas said tongue jutting, which is done by people who feel they got away with something. Good acting, Dr. Alas said. When people compress their lips, it's a sign that they are feeling uncomfortable or anxious, and it could also signify one of the following, resentment, concentration, disapproval, arousal, and anger. Nose flares. People flare their nostrils when they're feeling passionate, trying to take in more oxygen. It can mean excitement, discomfort, or danger. Remember, when there's a disconnect between the verbal and nonverbal, choose to believe the nonverbal. Sometimes a person will nod when saying no, as we see in this video. I was absolutely paying attention during Jeff's meeting yesterday. And here he is demonstrating the opposite. I was definitely not here last Wednesday. Once again, trust the nonverbals over the verbals. Now let's talk about the arms. Keeping someone at arm's length is an idiom we're all very familiar with. It allows you to avoid being too close to someone. Arms behind the back is a nonverbal that signifies higher status. Do not come near me. Do not touch me. Arms reach out for love, hugs, and to make others feel better. Shoplifters use fewer arm movements. Restricted unmoving arms is done when a person is sad. Arms up in the air when the person is happy. Arms go to painful areas. They also protect our torso, the location of several important organs. Arms are reactive and defend us. Think of a handgun or, gun or something coming at us. They block us from a perceived threat. Pregnant moms-to-be will also cover their torso when they feel in danger. Here are some gravity-related arm movements from subtle to exuberant. Arms around a date is possessive. Arms near another person signifies comfort. Exposed underside of the wrist is considered comfortable or that you're interested in a person. Arms crossing can be self-hugging, protection, self-restraint, or dislike. Arms crossing as massaging suggests a person is stressed or concerned. 
Arms holding wrist is a sign of weakness. Arms spreading, also known as an elbow spread over space like a table or a desk, indicates confidence and they're claiming more territory. Thank you, House of Cards. Elbow narrowing indicates insecure and threatened. And big animated gestures, broad gestures, help get us noticed. Goose bumps are our body's way to react to cold and fear. Excessive sweating ventilates us through evaporation. Self-injury is a nonverbal communication about mental health. Arms akimbo, V patterns, hands at the waist signify authority and is a powerful nonverbal. Akimbo with thumbs forward means inquisitive or concerned. Hooding, person leans back and interlaces hands behind the head, indicates I am in charge. Before we move on from arms, I wanna take a moment to discuss shoulders and their importance in body language. A one and a half second shrug is normal. Less time or a single shrug can indicate discomfort. Look for the adapters. Forward and down can indicate bored. Shoulders can also be used as barriers. Moving on to hands. Handshakes are a great way to greet others and show respect. For some, the handshake is mild. Politicians have a two-handed gesture. And sometimes a handshake is a more of a power move, something Donald Trump was known for. In some countries, male friends holding hands is normal. But humans like to see hands and respond well to hand movements. Hidden hands can mean uncomfortable, sneaky, or deceptive. Offensive hand gestures such as pointing, middle finger, or snapping should be avoided. Training with the hands can be seen as disrespectful or self-absorbed. Nervous hands, trembling, if not part of the baseline, indicates discomfort. Ring playing is self-soothing, indicates low confidence. Steepling, touching the spread fingertips of both hands like praying, indicates confidence. Fingers are not interlocked and palms are not touching. Women tend to steeple low at the waist and men at the chest, which is considered more visible and powerful. Here is a modified steeple, extended index finger and thumb touching each other with fingers interlaced, some steeple under the table or above their heads. Fingers interlaced are meant to be low confidence. Hands do not move, less confidence. Interlaced stroking or rubbing of hands, ringing means nervous, stressed, or pacifying. Neck touching, covering the neck and the throat, indicates stress and discomfort. Playing with objects are pacifiers, nervous and stressed. Object placement is claiming your space and can be seen as confidence and power. Hands in the ready active position. Hands are about 14 inches apart with palms facing, watching each other with fingers spread apart. This is com commonly seen with speakers and is considered a confident position. Palms up display, humility. Palms down display, I didn't do it. Thumbs up in the air, high confidence. 
men grasping their lapels or women grasping their collars with thumbs up in the air, high confidence. Thumbs in pocket, low. And the last hands nonverbal is genital framing, which is when you hook your thumbs in the waistband and dangle your fingers to frame your genitals, and this is considered dominance. Now let's move on to the torso, and we're dressing the torso. First example, suit and tie. This type of clothing is seen as professional and authoritative and can be used to communicate that you are someone who is reliable and trustworthy. T-shirt and jeans is seen as casual and relaxed and can be used to communicate that you are someone who is approachable and down to earth. A sundress is seen as being feminine and elegant and used to communicate that you are confident and stylish. A hijab is a type of clothing seen as being religious and modest and used to communicate that you are devout and following the teaching of your faith. How we dress our torso can be interpreted differently depending on the context. Situational awareness. A suit and tie may signify professionalism in a work setting, but stuffiness in a social one. The torso protects the vital organs. When the torso leans away from people we do not like, it requires energy to hold that position and we will tire. Couples in a bad relationship may blade and rotate towards each other with their head only. Now let's look at some examples of torso distancing. Ventral denial shift or turn away from those we do not like. Ventral is vulnerable and here we are turning our backs. Ventral fronting to those we favor, such as with hugs and holding hands. Leaning forward with people we like. Colleagues that share the same point of view will often sit closer together and lean in. Torso shield creates barriers, arms, jackets, objects. This protects us from the rest of the world. The way we hold our torso can communicate a lot about how we are feeling. For example, people who are feeling confident or open may stand up straight with their shoulders back while people that are feeling nervous or closed off may hunch their shoulders and lower their head. Posture. The way we hold our torso can communicate a lot about how we're feeling. For example, People who are feeling confident may open, may stand up straight and their shoulders back while people who are feeling nervous or closed off may hunch their shoulders and lower their head. Gestures, we can also use our torso to make gestures. Torso is a common target for touch. The amount of space we keep between ourselves and others is also a form of nonverbal communication influenced by a torso. People who are uncomfortable or distant may stand further apart. Other examples of torso blocking include reaching across the front and playing with your watch, adjusting shirt sleeves or cup flakes, or playing with your tie knot. Some people may use torso more than others to express themselves non-verbally. As you've noticed by now, the meaning of these gestures can vary depending on the context. You also need to gauge them from baseline. For example, crossing your arms can be seen as a sign of defensiveness in some contexts, but may be seen as a sign of comfort in others. Crossing your arms can mean you're upset or defiant you may be crossing your arms because you're cold, which means you're uncomfortable. In some cultures, crossing your arms is a sign of respect. In others, you got it, it's a sign of disrespect. 
When upset, your stomach, your digestive system no longer has the blood flow for digestion. Thank you, Olympic system. And many people will vomit after a tragic event. Bowing to one another is also a sign of respect and can take on many forms. Now we're moving on to legs. Cross legs is a common gesture and has a variety of meanings depending on contacts. In some cases, it's a sign of comfort and relaxation and others can be a sign of defensiveness or closed offness. This is why you need to see it with other nonverbals to get the true meaning. Clusters, knees touching, arm on shoulder, comfort. Knees not touching and bodies turned away, not happy. Legs apart, this can be seen as a sign of confidence or dominance. It can also be a sign of sexual interest, especially if the person is also making eye contact and smiling. Legs together can be a sign of nervousness or insecurity. It can also be a sign of submissiveness, especially if the person is making less eye contact and avoiding smiling. People with a place to go will walk with purpose. Predators lurk. Wait. Legs splay, seen in confrontational situations for better balance and claim greater territory. Predators use this as well as eye glaze, gaze behavior to control others. In Japan, crossing your legs in formal or business situations is considered rude. It makes you look like you have an attitude or you're self-important. Additionally, sitting with your back straight and your legs together with one hand on each knee is taught from childhood. This posture reads as, I am humbly listening to your conversation. When an individual stands with their legs shoulder width apart and their feet firmly planted on the ground, it conveys confidence and power. Standing with one leg in front of the other can also be a sign of dominance or authority. When one sits with their legs crossed at the ankles or the knees, it makes them seem less approachable and secure. If the legs are pointed towards another person, it can be seen as a sign of attraction. Poker players have benefited from keeping an eye on foot and leg behavior. Oftentimes when a player has a great hand, they will inadvertently give that away by demonstrating happy feet. And you guessed it, next topic, feet. Tapping the foot can be a sign of impatience, boredom, or anxiety, as does rocking the foot back and forth. Desmond Morris observed that feet communicate more honestly than any other body part thanks to our limbic brain. Feet and legs communicate happiness, stomping, dancing, jumping, toes in the air, excited, gravity defying, happy feet, feet and legs wiggle and bounce with joy, signifying high confidence. But it can also mean impatience or some people just have naturally jittery legs. Feet and ankle touching indicates comfort, intimacy. Take a look at this video. Do they want to be there? How do you know? We also see clusters, hands and face that support the feet. If the feet shift toward the door or away from the other, 
they are ready to go. Two people speaking toe to toe, they want to talk. If they are toe and one foot out, L-shaped, they want to leave even if they're facing you. In this video, leg crossing indicates comfort. Legs crossed and one foot leaning toward a person, like and trust. If a person naturally moves or shakes their feet and then freezes, that's when you need to take notice. Turn toes in or interlock your feet, that demonstrates insecurity. That means someone is anxious or feeling threatened. People that lie will not move their feet during an interview and will interlock their feet in a way to restrict movement. Locking feet around chair is called restraining, freeze behavior, and says the person is troubled. A stressed person may hide their feet altogether, minimizing exposed body parts. If their feet do not move to welcome you and they only rotate at the hip to greet you, no matter how warm that smile is, just keep on walking by. Furthermore, when a relationship is turning sour, there will be less and less foot contact. A couple may hold hands in public, but their feet simply avoid each other as feelings cool. Alternatively, when people like each other, they will increase proximity of their feet, culminating eventually with touch or what we refer to as playing footsies. Remember, look for clusters, foot lock and leg cleansing, for example. Speaking of courtship, women often telegraph their interest in another by how they play with their shoe, dangling it from their toes in the presence. This is a high comfort display that says, I am very comfortable with you. But the minute they're no longer interested in the other person or feels uncomfortable, note how quickly that foot goes back into the shoes. The other video demonstrates clasped knees ready to go, followed by a forward lean of the torso and a shift of the lower body to the edge of the chair. Here we have three videos. The first one shows happy, but not intimate, just friendly. B, comfort with each other. And C, sad, feet withdrawn. We've completed the body nonverbals and I have good news for you. I have some infographics that you can download at the end of this presentation. We are skipping truth and lies, conflict resolution, interpersonal relations, and body business language. And we're moving on to micro expressions. This is the final module. Paul Ekman started researching facial expressions and body language in 1957. 1967, he discovered micro expressions. He was the scientific consultant for the TV series, Lie to Me. Micro expressions are fleeting facial expressions that occur in a fraction of a second. They're often involuntary and reveal the true emotions of a person, even if they're trying to hide them. He identified seven universal emotions, surprise, fear, happiness, anger, contempt, sadness, and disgust. The first thing you may notice is emotions can be categorized by face locations, eyebrows, eyes, nose, and lips. There may be some movement in other areas, just not as predominant or predictable. Recognizing the seven individually can be difficult. The motions are fast, so it's best to look at the region on the face where the movement happened, then deduce the emotion. For example, if you only see movement in the eyes and brow, you will know it's surprise or fear. Both of them are hard to differentiate. Remember the actions are based on what is happening around you. That should help you determine which one in a real life setting. There are small differences in the two emotions, eyebrow, straight in fear, curve in surprise. Sometimes you'll see lip movement in fear. The whites of the eyes are more visible in fear. 
Again, the actions happen incredibly fast. So by recognizing first the location, then determining the emotion, you can cancel out many options. Happy. Sometimes the eyes will crinkle when you smile. This is one of the easiest emotions to identify because while you may not know why, you will find yourself wanting to smile back. Brows and mouth movement indicate anger. The eyebrows pull down and the eyes and together eyelids are raised. Lips may be compressed or open and the chin may jut forward. Contempt is largely, largely just the mouth, but asymmetrical. Also one of the easiest ones to recognize. Notice the tightening of the lip corner. Sadness is similar to contempt and is one of the hardest ones to read. Eyes can pull the bra brows down, upper lip may be raised or in a pout. Disgust happens in the middle of the face. If you see movement there, it's always disgust. Okay, let's break it down. Surprise, raised eyebrow and eyelid. Fear, wrinkles, raised eyebrow, wide eyes. Happy, movement in the mouth area, maybe some, maybe some nasolabial folding and eye narrowing if it's a very big smile. Anger. Lowering of the eyebrow, tense eyelid, tightening lips, and the chin forward. Contempt, primarily a unilateral upper lip raise, and this can cause the cheek to raise, resulting in a slight narrowing of the eyelid. Sad, inner eyebrows up and raised eyelid. You may see a mouth pout. Disgust means the nose will wrinkle. This could cause the upper lip to raise, revealing teeth. Now for some fun. For the remainder of this module, you will see an image on the left, Dr. Ellis. He will demonstrate a micro expression and you have to pay close attention to his face and then figure out which one he is doing. Let's see how well you do on your own. Ready? Read it. Did you guess anger? If so, you were correct. Next one. How many got that one right? Surprise. Next. Sad, good job. Well, that one was easy, wasn't it? Next one. Contempt. Fear. Next. Yes, I tricked you there. It was another happy. Anger, and our last one.
Disgust. How did you do? Are you on your way to becoming a microexpression reading expert? <laughs> 